Hey everybody, welcome to my channel and Victoria Review Tour for short. Well, I usually use this channel for documenting my historical clothing construction this weekend in honor of COVID, or COVID, depending on how you want to say it, I'm going to be talking about early photography. COVID is a interactive educational weekend put on by the CauseTube community here on YouTube. We are releasing a ton of really interesting videos, there's going to be some live stream events, and different social things. Most of these videos are going to be kept up on our channels going forward in the future. So if you're here between July 30th and August 2nd, 2020, or if you're here in the future, check out the description below because I have linked the program guide in there and it will tell you all what's going on. I'm putting all kinds of links in the description below. So if I mention any resources or books that you think are interesting, go check there and see if there's a link for it. And at the end of the video, I'm going to tell you how to get this nifty badge ribbon thing if you're playing that game for CocoVid. For my contribution to CocoVid, I decided to talk about something a little different this week. And you might be saying, hey Vitor, uh, isn't this weekend supposed to be all about costuming and sewing? What are you doing talking about early photography? Well. I believe that looking at photographs is very important to researching what your costume is going to look like. Unless you're doing a costume pre-1839, then you're just kind of out of luck. Looking at photos of the era lets you see how the clothes actually fit people. Looking at fashion plates can be kind of discouraging because they're drawn as an ideal of a person and not actually how people look today, much like modern fashion illustrations. Looking at extant clothing is super valuable. But oftentimes they're photographed either laying flat or on a, ma a mannequin that they don't really fit or isn't padded correctly or like the museum curator, whoever, no fault of them. When they put it on the mannequin, they just didn't set it right. So the clothes aren't filled out how they're supposed to be. They don't have the proper undergarment structure. They don't have the proper padding added to them. Lots of things like that. Looking at photographs of people today and costumes that they've made today is a really fun and easy way to look at photographs, look at historical costumes and get inspired of what you want to make. But people just don't make things like they used to, you know? People don't fit things like they did back in the day. We just don't have that ingrained knowledge of living life every day in those clothes to know how they're supposed to fit exactly. Looking at historical photos gives us so much information about how people wore their clothes in the past. How they fit them, how they accessorized them, how they padded them, how they did their hair, how they posed, which can give you great ideas on how to take better photos of yourself and your costumes. When looking at early photographs, I think it's really important to have a little bit of a base knowledge about the different processes and how they worked and what types they were, when they were around, when the heydays were. So I've broken this series into four parts, one for each day of COVID. Today I'm going to talk about daguerreotypes, the first commercially successful photo process. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about ambrotypes and tintypes, wet plate collodion as a whole. Then on Saturday I'm going to talk about cased images, magic lanterns, and maybe a little bit about how to get started in early photography if you're like really inspired and want to try it of your own. Then on Sunday I'm going to talk about paper images, such as carte de physiques, cabinet cards, and stereo cards. I'm going to tell you the important parts of the processes and things you need to know about how they worked, as well as some idiosyncrasies that are really important to keep in mind when you're looking at early photographs. Let me tell you a little bit about my background in photography so you know that I'm not just making all this information up. I got my first camera when I was about eight. It was a Crayola 110 film camera. From there, I moved on to SLR, did a lot of film, swore I'd never do digital. Had my first darkroom experiences in high school, and went on to study photography in college, winding up with a BA with an emphasis in photography, theater design, and agriculture. Evergreen. After college, I kind of gave up photography for a while because I didn't really have a dark room. But now, the past three years, I've been working on a fine art photography certificate program at the fabulous Photographic Center Northwest in Seattle. It's probably going to take me a couple more years to finish that up, but it's great in keeping me into practice and really 
broadening my knowledge in photography. I've always been really interested in more traditional and historical methods. Love me the zone system. Love me the alternative processes. Ten years ago, I took my first workshop in the wet plate collodion process with a fabulous photographer named John Confer. He lives out in the Finger Lake region. He brought the process back from extinction in the 1980s while traveling around the country in a horse-drawn wagon like an itinerant photographer from the 19th century. He's an amazing guy who's really dedicated his life to the study of tintypes and amber types and everything you can do with wet plate. He does workshops up on his farm and he's amazing. Really, it's like how much John Coffer knows about wet plate is amazing. Since then I've at least tried a lot of other processes and there's definitely a lot more I want to learn. Now onto the history of photography. Photography is one of those really cool things where multiple people discovered, like, invented it at the same time in different places. There were a couple of methods that people were trying around with in the early 1800s, some of them more successful than others. The first commercially successful process was developed by Louis Daguerre in 1839. Daguerre named his process the Daguerreotype. Daguerreotypes, or DAGs as they're known for short, are direct positive images that are captured on the silver-coated copper plate. Direct positive is an image that's made directly from exposure to light and development without the use of a negative. It's automatically a positive. You don't need a negative to make a positive like you do in traditional black and white photography in the darker. This silver-coated copper plate is highly polished to a mirror-like surface. When I say highly polished, I mean it. Those things are polished like hundreds of times, literally. I did a workshop in daguerreotype making a couple years ago. Let me tell you, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice and a lot of time to polish those plates enough to not have any spots show up. This mirror-like surface makes it really easy to identify a daguerreotype versus a different photograph. It also makes them pretty hard to photograph. I have a couple of original daguerreotypes here. I think I probably paid between like 20 and 40 dollars for them. This one I think was probably 40 because I really liked the case that I was in. This one, this case is broken so it was like 20 dollars. This one I think is from the 1840s. This one's more a little later, like the 1850s maybe. You can see though that it's mirrored surface and depending on the angle that you look at it, it either appears as a positive or a negative. I also have a couple daguerreotypes that I shot. This one's of a street view of downtown Seattle. And this one is a self-portrait where I'm holding the paddles that you use for polishing the plates. Daguerreotypes always come in a case like this. They're extremely fragile. The surface is very delicate. If you touch it with your fingers, you can brush the image away. They do always have a cover glass on them, so that protects them. There's usually a seal around the edge of the cover glass that tapes it all together. Don't tamper with it, please. If you have a daguerreotype and the seal is broken and you're worried about it deteriorating, talk to some experts rather than doing anything on your own. By 1853, there were 85 studios in New York City alone. The daguerreotypes weren't cheap to get. A portrait in 1842 could cost between $2.50 and $6 in their dollars, which in 2020 dollars is between $75 and $175. But by the 1850s, they're down to as cheap as about 50 cents or $15 today. However, that could still be a week or more's wages in 1850s money. A well-made daguerreotype, though, is a thing of beauty. I highly recommend seeing a daguerreotype at some point in your life if you're able to. A lot of like art museums might have them, things like that. Antique stores, you can find them often too. Go seek one out and look at it in person. There's something so special about looking at a photo that is 
150 years or more old and seeing yourself reflected back as well. They're sometimes called a mirror with a memory and I just think that is so special. The amount of detail in these photographs is astounding. And the really good daguerreotypes, they just take your breath away. Really good daguerreotypes can sell for thousands of dollars, even like a hundred thousand dollars or more depending on the subject. But it's still possible to find beautiful ones for less. Mine are not the easiest to see, but still pretty amazing. There's a huge range of daguerreotypes out there in the world and a lot of devoted collectors to them. The Daguerreian Society is a society devoted to early photography, especially daguerreotypes, and the collection and preservation and education of them. It's pricey to join, so I was only a member for a year when they had a special going on where you would just send them some money for postage and they would send you as many of their journals and annuals as they could for that amount. So I was like, here's $20. And they were like, great, media mail. Here's 60 pounds worth of books. They have a newsletter, it's digital now, but it's got some interesting articles in it. This one has a article on the search for a Revolution War generation. So it has a bunch of images of people that are identified that fought in the Revolutionary War or were the kids of people who were in Revolutionary War soldiers. It's got a lot of images of the daguerreotypes and some carte physiques or they have interesting articles about like spirit photographs. They're a lot of fun to look through because they go in depth about how different plates like you can polish off the image and shoot the plate again but sometimes the image is left behind so that they have that's what this article is about. Um, they have really interesting advertisements too so of different auctions that were coming up this one's all about post-mortem photographs they also publish an annual which is an in-depth journal all about different topics in daguerreotypes and early photography it's quite academic but that does have a lot of images reprints of photographs which you can look at and get some ideas so if you interested in this topic and want to learn more, they're not a bad society to join if you can afford it. They also have a Facebook page where people post a lot of images of daguerreotypes and have fun discussions sometimes of debates about <laughs> different topics in daguerreotypes. <laughs> oh man. They have an annual convention that I'd love to go to some year that's really big but obviously this year it's canceled, so they're doing a bunch of talks on Zoom, which they're posting on their website. Again, a lot of people who collect gear types have a lot of money, so these talks cost. But I think that if you donate to their organization, I don't think you have to be a member, you can view the talks. They had one last week by a man who specializes in daguerreotypes from Argentina and Uruguay, so that's an interesting way to broaden your selection of images that you see. They have one coming up on spirit photography, that sounds pretty interesting. The Daguerre website also has a lot of resources on it that you don't need to be a member to access, including a cool video on how daguerreotypes are made, so if you want to see that, I recommend going and checking them out. There's a lot of books out there on early photography and daguerreotypes. So like the early American daguerreotype tells you all about early experimentations and how America's like helped change the daguerreotype process. It's got some images in it, but not a ton. It's a lot of text. Mirror image, the influence of the daguerreotype on American society all about daguerreotypes in the American society. Again, a lot of text, but there are a collection of plates in the back which are reprinted pretty well. And as you see, they've got some information about them, about like roughly when they were taken, who they were taken by, uh, any who owns the daguerreotype now, or at least they did when this book came out, and any other information about them. All of my historic photo images are of white people. White people are cheap and plentiful to get early photographs of. If you try to collect some photos of other minorities, they can be a little bit more pricey. But I did find this book I recently added to my collection, Daguerreotypes and Tintypes and African Americans, A History in Photographs, 
which is pretty cool. It's got lots of big photographs of African Americans. It doesn't have any information on them, like where the image is from, like year guesses, who the people are, but it does have nice big images. I thought I ordered volume one. This is volume two. This says volume one. So I don't know, but there's two volumes. It's pretty cheap on Amazon. I recommend it. Daguerreotypes are a process I'd love to continue studying and someday practice on my own. But it involves a lot of different equipment than what I have now and a lot of different chemicals. Clean some pretty hazardous ones, including bromine, bromine and mercury vapors. So I'd need some really good ventilation where I do my developing and I don't have that set up yet. Maybe one day, but you gotta respect your chemicals. I'm just thankful I had the opportunity to learn how to do it once. There's not many daguerreotypists around in the world today practicing maybe like in the tens, like, you know, less than a hundred people. I can think of like five. There's probably some more hiding out there though. So in conclusion, daguerreotypes, super awesome. Started in 1839, stuck around for a couple decades. Easy to identify because of that mirrored surface. Think of beauty, go find one. I hope that you subscribe to my channel and stick around because I'll be back over the next three days at the same time with different videos on early photography. Tomorrow's video on amber types and tintypes is going to have some very important information that also pertains to daguerreotypes, so be sure not to miss that one. On Saturday, my video about cases is going to have some very valuable information about how to, how to date daguerreotypes, the resources for that. So don't miss that one either. And then on Sunday, the one about print images, you know, just stick around for that too, because it's going to be fascinating. Then I'll be getting back to historical clothing, sewing, and you know, you should probably stick around for those too. So go hit that subscribe button and come back soon. Though if you're watching this in the future, just go ahead and go watch those videos now, because I put them all on a playlist for you. In the meantime, check out the other CocoVid videos and have a great time. End scene on daguerreotypes.